Well, Alex, uh, thank you for inviting me today. Um, this is a great meeting, and Alex um, has invited me for the last uh, two years before today, and I was always out of town, so I'm glad I was able to make it. And I'm uh, looking forward to going over the IRIS registry with you. Uh, for those of you that uh, remember, back in the 19... In the 1990s, um, the American Academy of Ophthalmology actually created a registry uh, for cataract surgery called NEON, and they happened to be about 25 years too early because it didn't go so well. Um, so in terms of um, this talk, I don't have any disclosures, although I am a consultant to Glaucos. And uh, for the IRIS registry, since NEON didn't go anywhere, um, it's actually the nation's first comprehensive eye disease clinical database in the United States. Um, and one of the things is there are a lot of advantages with the IRIS registry um, that as time goes on we're finding, but it really allows the individual ophthalmologist who submits their data to the IRIS registry to actually be able to see what's happening with their patient practice and also to be able to improve their delivery of care because they can actually compare themselves to individuals around the country. Um, anonymously. In addition, um, one of the things about IRIS is it really helps us meet the requirements of the Federal Physician Quality Reporting System and also MIPS, and I'll go over that a little bit. And um, they do use HIPAA compliant methods to collect data from the patient records. And the patient records get into the IRIS registry mainly through electronic health records. However, uh, there are practices in the United States that are actually going in on the web and entering data. Some of them are even sending in um, paper to be able to participate in the IRS registry. So one of the things about the IRS registry, it is a secondary data. And what I mean by that, it's actually information that's already been collected. So it's not really a clinical trial. You're not collecting it prospectively to see what happens. It's data that's being collected in the office anyway. And what's happening now is that we're having more and more individuals use secondary data to do research because it's a great resource. It's something we didn't have uh, even 20 years ago because we didn't really have the capability technologically, and we also didn't have the statistics and the analytical abilities to use it. Advantages of using secondary data is it's very quick. The data can be de-identified, um, so you don't really have to get IRB approval for that specific research. You can get it to use de-identified databases. Um, some of the problems with it is that the data collection and the entry and how people actually register their data is different because this is everybody's clinical practice. So for electronic health record, um, I might put some information about a patient into my assessment and plan by saying that they're stable or that they have progressing glaucoma, but I might not be checking a box that says that. So it might not show up in the electronic health record. And so um, this is one of the issues we're having is that people put data and information in different places in the electronic health records. And so you try to match that, but that can be an issue. In addition, um, one of the things people find is when they're looking at their data and you're looking at what you put in on your patients, that all of a sudden, you know, I check pressure on everybody in my office, but not everybody in my office is ending up with pressure in the data. You know, for some reason, it might not have been entered um, in the electronic health record, and so all of a sudden you have a missing field. And so that also shows up especially when you think you've never had an error like that because you check pressure on everybody to make a decision, uh, but you do have that in electronic health records. And so I briefly wanted to show you that with the Medicare database that was from billing, that was one of the first examples of secondary data that we had in the United States. And at the time, you know, we're looking at hundreds of thousands of information. So it was very um, important with the Medicare database. It got us thinking about secondary data use, especially for looking at rare complications such as endophthalmitis uh, after cataract surgery, also retinal detachments and corneal edema and transplantation, all done by Jonathan Javid in the early 90s. There's also been the use of the Medicare data to look at how we use visual field testing, um, and this all was done in about 100,000 to 200, 300,000 patients. And these were huge data sets back then. 
Well, one of the things about the IRS registry is that it's even bigger than what we were doing back um, at that time. Currently, uh, for the American Academy of Ophthalmology, there are 18,128 physicians um, from 5,000 plus practices that are enrolled in the IRS registry. 15,149 of these physicians are actually using the electronic health record where you actually have um, FIGMD come and put a software component on your server, and then it automatically collects the data. You have about 3,000 practices where someone's actually manually entering the data so that they can participate in IRIS registry. And when you look at the number of patients, if you remember from the Medicare database, I said we're around 100,000 to 300,000 individuals we're looking at. With the IRIS registry, um, as of September 1 this year, they had 221 million visits with 51.81 uh, million patients, so about 52 million individuals that are in the IRIS registry uniquely. Currently, um, the Academy has been able to integrate with 55 electronic health record systems. So there are at least 55 electronic health record systems in the United States. And so um, we do have EPIC up there. That's the one that's used in a lot of the academic centers. Um, and it's provided some challenges, but some of the sites have been able to get involved. Um, UCLA is currently working on that. And this is just showing you the distribution of all of the different practices across the United States that are actually integrated with the IRS registry. So one of the things that we found with the Medicare database is that people practice medicine differently in the different regions of the United States. Um, glaucoma is treated differently in New England than it is in Southern California versus Florida. And so uh, this will also be able to be further investigated into more detail. You know, are people using just different pieces of information to make decisions? And that's why it's looking like we're practicing differently around the country. Uh, but we'll be able to do that with the IRS registry. When you um, get the IRS registry, they have a dashboard, and I'm going to um, show you that. Uh, one of the things to realize is that it's going to be changing this spring, and they're going to be making the dashboard uh, more user-friendly. Uh, but what they have now is you can actually have the different measures that are used for quality measures uh, for reporting to the federal government. And so this is showing when you um, look at your own individual data in your own individual practice or in the practice group, if you want to look at it that way, um, you can see how well you're doing in terms of um, evaluating the optic nerve for iris point one. Um, if you can see that, this individual did extremely well, over 90%, and they meet the benchmark. And so you get all green. Green is always good in ophthalmology. <laughs> Um, here, when you look at these IRS measures 14 to 19, um, this individual, in terms of using high-risk medications in the elderly, he got a red, or she did, and so they were prescribing more high-risk medications to the elderly. Um, unfortunately, uh, that's probably topical beta blockers, and so um, I probably would have a lot of uh, red in my practice, um, so you would know exactly what you're doing. I'm not going to stop prescribing uh, topical beta blockers, but that would give me a bad measure at that level. And this is just showing you how you can also track how you or your practice is doing in terms of coding or identifying things and meeting these measures uh, that are then submitted to the federal government if you want to. Um, so one, the IRS registry lets you evaluate your own data. And then also you can start looking at the management of patients at a population level and start asking some questions. Well, I always feel that my patients are more complicated than uh, someone down the street or maybe even one of the different practitioners at UCLA. And you could actually go in and look at that. How does your practice differ from the national average or from different people in the region, although you're not going to be able to look at the individual doctors because it's all anonymous. So when you also um, look at the IRS registry, it's been very useful in terms of helping members with MIPS, as I mentioned. Um, it calculates and selects the six best measures to maximize the score. So for that example where there was a red on the dashboard because of using high-risk medications in the elderly, such as topical beta blockers, 
that score could be ignored because that individual did well on all of the other 15 measures. And so with the IRS registry, it's going to take the top six best measures and then report those to the federal government because that's what needs to be reported for MIPS. In addition, um, one of the things the IRS registry allows is by participating in it, you get 10% of your points uh, for MIPS and then for how you get um, graded by the federal government with Medicare management for meeting the public health clinical data registry reporting objective. So just by being someone who participates in the IRS registry, you get 10% of the points, which helps you. And um, one of the things that IRS registry also does is it um, satisfies four activities related to clinical data registries. So that helps you with MIPS and with the federal government. And it also helps you with maintenance of certification. Um, it allows you to have one activity that's related to maintenance of certification. And so that actually helps satisfy part four maintenance of certification. Um, so it's not only helping you with MIPS and for reimbursement from the federal government, but it's also helping you for maintenance of certification if you need that. And this is just um, showing what was um, available to individuals who participated in the IRS registry in 2017. $186 million were saved in penalties that were avoided by ophthalmologists participating in the IRS registry. So that's a lot of money um, that was saved. In addition, 99% uh, of the IRS registry submissions earn some kind of bonus. So 99% of the participants got a bonus. And 91% of the electronic health record integrated IRS registry participants earn the MIPS exceptional bonus. So for those individuals with electronic health records, you know, they happen to be able to provide more data because with electronic health record, the FIGMD software actually goes in and pulls all of the important data fields and you don't have to have someone manually entering it. And so you have a little bit better chance of getting the MIPS exceptional bonus. And then they did uh, 19,286 NPI and TIN combinations. And so it's really able to um, present the information as needed uh, for this performance measure. Now, the IRS registry is not only used for maintenance of certification or for MIPS or for reporting to the federal government or even for looking at how your own patients are doing and comparing yourself to the rest of the nation or the region. Um, one of the things uh, that we're able to do is that David Pyatt provided about a $2 million endowment to the American Academy of Ophthalmology to create a glaucoma education center on the One Network. How many people have been on the One Network and seen the Pyatt Glaucoma Education Center? Not a lot. Well, <laughs> I'd advise you to go there and see it uh, because uh, a lot of your faculty have contributed to it. And I think um, one of the nice things about it is it provides freely available instruction. You can actually go in and see videos on um, how to do the different surgeries that you've learned about today. Um, it also integrates the elements of the IRS registry um, so that you can actually look and see what's happening with glaucoma surgery, with glaucoma patients around the country, and I'll show you that. Um, and then also um, the goal is to establish an online peer network where you can actually um, have glaucoma specialists and different providers connected worldwide. And so uh, one of the goals of creating an education center like this and using the IRS registry is that the goal of the American Academy of Ophthalmology is to help us remain educated um, and also to help us have new information that we can then integrate into our practices and how we take care of our patients so that we're always giving them the best quality of care. So that's one of the reasons why we have the standards, the American Academy of Ophthalmology Practice Guidelines. And then we created the One Network for education. Um, one of the issues that's now popular with continuing medical education is what's the practice gap? What is it that you're not doing after being out for 10 years uh, that maybe you should do and would help uh, your patients do better or that would help you in managing your patients or being more comfortable with what you decide? And then um, how do you get that knowledge? Is it that you come to meetings like this and this is where you get the knowledge or is it you talk to someone? Uh, during one of the networking sessions, or is it that you email them or you call them on the phone? But how do you 
continually learn so that you're constantly giving the best care that you can give. Um, there have been a lot of studies that it takes about 20 years for new knowledge to get into a clinical practice. And so how can we make it quicker so that as we start getting more devices, getting more technology, getting more information, we get it to our patients? And so um, one of the things is hoping that the IRIS registry might help with that by providing new data, which will then give us new information that can then also influence the guidelines and also how we take care of the patients. So in 2017, we launched the uh, education network, and that was done in collaboration with American Glaucoma Society and also 45 different editors that were all glaucoma specialists. And one of the things we did is we took the information from 2017 on glaucoma patients and procedures and made it available uh, for you to look at on the one network in the Glaucoma Education Center. And this is showing you that um, over time from 2013 to 2016, the number of glaucoma patients has been increasing. Well, that's not because we have an epidemic happening in the United States. It's just more practices are coming on board, so there are more patients represented with glaucoma. So this is kind of cross-sectional each year. It's not showing that there's a huge epidemic of glaucoma growing. It's just telling us how many patients came on board that year that had glaucoma, and we could look at the procedures. So this is showing you um, when you go to the One Network, and now they have the 20... Um, 17 data is that you can see, you can look at the type of glaucoma that you find in the United States by year. You can hit 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016, and now we have 2017. And it just shows you, you know, the number one type in the United States of glaucoma we have. It's not surprising. It's primary open angle glaucoma. But you can also go and get an idea of the different types of glaucoma uh, that we have in addition to primary open angle glaucoma. You can also look at the demographics of the patients in terms of looking at their ethnicity. Once again, by year, it's not changing. This is just new patients are being enrolled as practices are bought on board. But you can see how it divides out um, in terms of the type of glaucoma and also the demographics of those individuals with glaucoma. In terms of the glaucoma surgical procedures and types, I find this one uh, really fascinating because you can look and see, um, you know, the number one type of procedure is non-incisional. It's laser trabeculoplasty. But then you can see exactly in terms of what type of glaucoma are individuals doing laser trabeculoplasty or at least coding it in their electronic health record or in the data that they're submitting to the IRS registry. And so um, it kind of gives you information that you can use to see kind of what are the trends in the country in terms of the management of glaucoma and where do you fit in with that. And then this is just showing you um, insurance type. You can see that in the IRIS registry um, that, you know, you have individuals that have Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the military insurance, and you can get an idea of what percentage of those individuals have glaucoma and the different types by insurance type if you're interested. So um, in 2015, I gave the Jackson Memorial Lecture and I presented the first data with the IRIS registry looking at the endophthalmitis rate after cataract surgery. And I just want to point out, since then, there have been um, 10 publications using the IRIS registry. A lot of it's done to look at rare diseases, although now um, we'll start being looking at also uh, the management of patients across the region as more individuals have come on board. Um, one of the advantages of the IRIS registry is that it's also going to be able to allow us to do clinical trials more cheaply. Um, the FDA has actually put in some patient outcomes that can be used um, and then be uploaded into the IRIS registry so you can actually see if patients are happy or not after surgery. You would be able to look at patient reported outcomes after different procedures and that will eventually be available. And so the IRIS registry has really entered into the realm of big data. 
And so one of the things that we'll be doing is combining it um, not just with the electronic medical record from ophthalmologists, but also trying to see what's happening with emergency rooms and also with the different specialties that have other electronic medical records so that we get a more complete picture of the patient and their health. So um, the goal is to close the loop in terms of learning and to really um, enhance our ability uh, to contribute to our patients through scientific knowledge, but also through um, improving the quality of their care. And this is just a slide on the different uh, resources related to the IRS registry. If you have any questions, because this talk was rather quick, but it goes over the MIPS guide, also the roadmap, how you can use it, um, and also who you could contact um, if you do need help with the IRS registry or want to get involved with it. So thank you.